which is very special. And I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I think I'm missing one and I probably am missing one, but um, we have about an hour's worth of content. So um, let's get started. Are we starting with um, the Senator or you wanna play the Super oh, Senator? Card? Yeah, start with the Senator. And I'll mute myself so you don't hear me sniffling when the video comes on with the uh, kids. Elena Parent, thank you so much for allowing me to spend a couple minutes with you today. Virtual. Found. Efforts and your diligence in furthering the cause of helping kids in Georgia learn to read um, and especially progress towards helping kids with dyslexia learn to read. The interesting thing is, I feel like we are still, despite our progress in passing SB 48 a couple of years ago to screen kids uh, for dyslexia in the early grades, stuck in a mindset where not enough has changed. It's like this huge light bulb went off for me where I realized, oh my gosh, we've got this huge and unacceptable percentage of children in third grade that, that are not proficient readers. And it's the majority of our kids. And then meanwhile, that was when I found out that up to 30% of kids um, have dyslexia. And it's kind of like ding, 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 ding. You know, clearly these two things are related. But it's kind of like turning the Titanic around a little bit to change what really is obviously a vast bureaucracy of curriculum and um, public school education. And that's why your um, activism on it is still critically needed. We took a baby, baby first step with SB 48, but we're still nowhere near getting all of the teachers trained on the, the reading programs that we know that science tells us not only teach the kids with dyslexia to read, but they help so many other struggling readers as well. In fact, they're just better methods um, for teaching all children how to read. We need to get those teachers trained. We need to have te teachers and educational leadership that understand that and move uh, that, that big ship around towards just a different approach to teaching reading. But we really can't do it soon enough because we're losing kids every year and the, delay, the delays and delays are frustrating to me. Um, I know that recent reports are telling us that with um, moving forward to try to be more successful in implementing SB 48, we need to make sure that we have some um, guardrails around what programs or what types of programs actually are used to teach our kids. Not all programs have the, the science proving their effectiveness behind them. So I think that the smartest thing to do there would be to, to draft up some language where we, we do put that in the hands of a board, maybe in the um, state uh, board of education um, to, to be the ones to develop the criteria. And, and, and the criteria could um, also go in the legislation and, and from what experts tell me, it would be likely to look a lot like um, the structured literacy programs that have already been proven to work. The bigger challenge is we need to put more funds into this. Um, obviously, it is not a small feat to train and retrain thousands of teachers and um, administrators too um, on this these new methodologies. And it is really hard because I've been screaming it for years uh, to get additional money for our public schools at the state capitol. Um, and I really, really think that is so regrettable and I'm beating a drum about it and yelling about it every year. Um, but we need different leadership before it's truly the number one priority. Um, I'm not saying the majority doesn't care right now because they do care, but the funds to get really important things like this off the ground and going are just really slow to come by. And right now we're still in a pandemic um, deficit with our public schools. So we really have to be loud and really, really keep up our advocacy. Um, 
but you know, I mean, I'm committed to this issue. I'm really excited knowing that there's these, these things that we understand that we know about that, that science and research tells us that we can do that's going to help our kids that struggle the most and all our kids learn to read. I mean, it is such a huge problem. It's been discussed for years. We have the Get Georgia Reading Board. We have all kinds of things. And it's like, guys, this is staring at us in the face. We need to get going. Thank you for what you're doing. And I look forward to talking soon. Bye. Tina, are you saying anything between them? I, I, I just realized I was still muted. Um, the Senator Parent had some excellent, um, excellent words of advice um, for us. And um, she has a lot of, uh, again, she has a lot of parents in her district whose kids are affected by dyslexia, who know that they're affected by dyslexia and they're very vocal with her. Um, I happen to go to church with her. Um, so, you know, again, the more connections we make within our communities, the better and stronger our allyship will be across every possible connection in the state, whether it is uh, Chairman Workheiser and uh, his relationships to industry here in Georgia, to finding our way to the incoming uh, Board of Regents, um, the current Board of Regent for the State University system is retiring this year. And that's another opportunity we need to make ourselves uh, aware of. Um, the, the way that all of this is structured is so, it's like an onion. Every time I turn around in a meeting and someone cites another organization, it's like down another rabbit hole because between advocacy organizations, um, the advocacy organizations, there are policy organizations, there are so many people who have a seat at the table and parents need to be at that table. We do. That, that's all there is to it. Um, the next video is, uh, let's go to Hildebrand Pelzer III with his message about the school to prison pipeline. And while this is running, I'm gonna get these live on our YouTube channel. Thank you, Decoding Dyslexia Georgia and Tina Ingberg, state leader of Decoding Dyslexia Georgia for inviting me to be part of Dyslexia Day at the Capitol. I am always happy to speak about an important education topic dear to me, the school to prison pipeline. More importantly, I want to help parties interested in eradicating the school to prison pipeline to understand the intricate connection between early literacy and feelings of self-worth and between illiteracy and juvenile delinquency. To do this, let me begin with the true story that will set the direction for my remarks and highlight reading instruction's potential if we focus on identifying and supporting children early who struggle with the reading. You see, one day at the Philadelphia Industrial Correctional Center, I was frightened by a frantic adult male inmate. I was walking from the minimum security side to the maximum security side of the correctional facility and out of nowhere, he confronted me. After eyeing me in the medical service area, his facial expression was scary. He was a large guy. His voice was deep and his tone was very demanding. He wanted immediate assistance with enrolling in GED classes. Now as the principal and GED examiner of the Philadelphia Prison System School, I thought he might be having a problem with the enrollment process and just needed my help with the referral. So I began to explain to him the enrollment steps. But in the middle of my explanation, he just cut me off and yelled, no, Mr. Principal, I'm not having that type of trouble. I'm still in the damn hooked on finance class and I want to get my GED. While I could understand and 
obviously feel this inmate's frustration. I had to think hard about what to say. I did not want to say the wrong thing to him and have all hell break loose in the jail. The reality is that I could provide nothing but the truth. I knew he could not go from learning phonics to a GED in a short time. His frustration was neither with me nor with the hooked on phonics class. What frustrated him was that he was carrying the burden of a lifetime of illiteracy. I'm gonna come back to that story in a few minutes. But first, let me formally say hello again and introduce myself. I am Hildebrand Pelzer III, an educator who has spent the past three decades in urban education, serving as a physical education teacher and assistant principal, a principal and an assistant regional superintendent. My career has intersected between education and incarceration. And the lessons I've learned have enabled me to engage in issues related to inadequate reading instruction, educational inequity, and illiteracy in the juvenile justice system. I'm also the author of Unlock a Potential, organizing the school inside a prison. I originally wrote Unlock a Potential, Potential to share strategies with superintendents of schools and correctional educators who were responsible for educating the prison youth and wanted to improve their schools for incarcerated youth, starting by addressing false assumptions about access to high quality education for youth in correctional settings. I soon realized the book had a much greater purpose, to rethink our theories about the school to prison pipeline by shifting the focus away from discipline policies as the reason children are going to jail, to reading instruction as the reason children are going to jail. My enthusiasm for student achievement stems from a career long commitment that began when I was a first year teacher at a correctional facility in Pennsylvania, serving incarcerated juvenile males. At that facility, I made one of the biggest decisions of my life to become a principal. My experience here gave me valuable insight into incarcerated youth education and their prior inadequate reading and school experiences. Some students could not even spell their first or last names. They were mostly black boys and they were alarmingly illiterate. My students found the most extraordinary ways of showing me their struggles. I did not learn about their reading problems by being their reading teacher. I was their physical education teacher. In this role, my students showed me their boldness, their toughness, and their athleticism. But on days that I helped the assistant principal with supervision of the school, I saw my students in a different environment. Classrooms, their performance was the opposite of what I knew them to be capable of. In the physical education setting, they were strong-minded, talented, and confident. Through athletics, I coached them and developed relationships with them. I was able to engage them in learning. In the classrooms where they had to learn reading, math, science, social studies, and other subjects, they floundered. They were shy. Their teachers had a tougher time leveraging the same connections that I had. The root cause of this contrast was the student's inability to read. Now, this fueled my passion to become a principal. I wanted to support disadvantaged students and strive to understand why so many of them could not read. According to studies on crime and delinquency, children who cannot read by the end of third grade are four times more likely to drop out of high school, which increases the likelihood they will enter the prison pipeline. Consequently, 70% of inmates read at or below a fourth grade level. Now, my initial story about the inmate I encountered at the Philadelphia Industrial Correctional Center highlights the persistent problem of children who grow up never learning how to read. This adult inmate's plight represents what it could look like for children if we don't get reading instruction right. His emotional exchange with me revealed how reading instruction had gone so wrong for him. And it amplified how it goes wrong for many children every day. At the age of 55, this inmate was a beginner reader. 
he was enrolled in a phonics program, which indicated that he had never been taught the relationships between letters and sounds. He did not master the alphabet. He could not decode or recognize words. His enrollment in a phonics program also indicated that he was just learning letter patterns and how to combine syllables with more complex sounds and syllable patterns, as well as how to manipulate syllables and sounds and words. Even more alarming is that his school principals and teachers likely missed the early warning signs that he was a struggling reader or perhaps a child who suffered from dyslexia. They either did not identify him as needing reading support and intervention, misunderstood the early warning signs, or just plain ignored them. They would have known whether he needed intensive intervention or not. Perhaps they did not know how to help him. Either way, no one did. At 55 years old, this African-American adult male inmate still could not be of course, he went through school reading well below grade level. He never developed the skills to read at his grade level and probably was passed on from grade to grade to grade without making progress in reading. He eventually grew from childhood to adulthood, from a boy to a grown man. But now he was an inmate still trying to learn how to read. His frustration with his own illiteracy fueled his courage to ask me for help on that day. He wanted to complete his education. He wanted an opportunity to attend classes to earn a GED. He wanted to know how to do it. He wanted to learn how to read. He did not give up. My experience with this inmate is cemented in my brain. To me, it represents why it is so important to identify children with reading difficulties in their early years of learning. Decoding Dyslexia Georgia and all the dyslexia advocacy groups and organizations around the world should be commended for their advocating for children and adults with reading difficulties in their early years of learning. Getting access to high quality structured reading instruction to children and adults who struggle to read, write, and spell and who do not have the means to access high quality reading instruction must be our number one priority. Taking these steps to achieve this priority will ultimately help struggling readers foster their enjoyment of reading and ultimately improve their reading proficiency. Thank you. Hilda Prime Pelzer the third has a very powerful message and I don't know if any of you are also aware of the story of um, Amir Baraka, an actor who is based in New Orleans. Um, but he found out that he was dyslexic while in prison and he has uh, been able to learn how to read um, after being incarcerated. Um, this is a difficult conversation to have because it points to some very, very, very disturbing trends and statistics in the state that if you're reading for one thing, you might miss it because it's buried um, and it doesn't receive the attention that it should. Um, according to the 2019 NAEP scores for the state of Georgia, only 17% 17% of black students in our state read proficiently by the fourth grade. That is criminal. And that is one of the reasons why we need to be louder because we need to be able to reach schools who are working with these kids who are not being identified as struggling readers and they are not necessarily receiving the instruction that they need. In fact, I bet my bottom dollar on it. Um, and, and the other part of that is that um, these schools that these kids are in are often underfunded. They don't have the fancy foundations that schools like ours, like many of our public schools have. 
to help fill in the gaps. Um, there are parents who don't necessarily know their, that their circumstances are being held against them in what our eligibility criterion uh, called exclusionary factors. If you're poor, you must be a bad reader. If you're poor, you know, it's this poverty narrative that keeps looping. And we need to keep chipping away at it. And, and, and I would say to those who think the one thing, we need to think about the other because reading and literacy is compounding the issue. Illiteracy is compounding poverty for people. And it's making it more difficult for, we're now in intergenerational situations related to that because whole language and balanced literacy have been in place since the early 1990s and earlier, uh, variations earlier. Um, and the, you know, the NAEP scores in Georgia, if you look at the graph, have remained flat since 1992. There have been no, no initiatives that have raised the number enough to make a statistical difference. And it's hard, it really is. Because we are failing children and, and we are failing our community. Um, let's move on to the next video so that we can keep our time frame going. Um, Hillary, I think the next one should be the Howard video, which is Howard students talking about early intervention, and it should be a link. There, yeah. When did someone first tell you you were dyslexic? I realized when I had trouble reading was when I was in third or in fourth grade. That's when I realized that I had trouble reading because I started hearing myself like a robot or different than usually. And sometimes I would just make up sentence. So the bat when I was seven and eight, it was in the second grade that I found it out. Eight? Yeah, eight. Uh, around the first grade. I was in second grade and it was September. It was a week before my birthday. And I remember my mom sat me down and she explained to me that I was just as equal to every other kid in my class, but I was just made differently. And she stressed that there was people out there that would help me with what, how I learned. And that I wasn't alone. There was hundreds of people like me. Just after kindergarten, but when I really knew that I had dyslexia was around like second, first grade. Uh, so I found out when I was probably like five or six, the first semester of first grade. Officially in third grade, but that came after my parents were both teachers and my parents probably knew much earlier than that. And they were the ones who sort of pushed for a diagnosis. Well, my mother was a school teacher for years and she had taught my sister and my brother how to read. So when I was about four years old, we sat down to learn to read uh, for her to teach me. And uh, she recognized right off the bat when there was a word that was W-A-S and I said saw. And she saw that there was something going on. So in those days, this would have been 1960, um, there was information out there, but you had to kind of dig to find it. So my mom did a lot of research and then she started working with me one-on-one. -on -one. So um, she called it dyslexia. I knew, knew it was dyslexia from the get-go, uh, but I was never officially diagnosed. How long did it take you to feel like you could read? 
Um, when I, um, basically, when I start hearing myself good, or when I start reading Junie B. Jones, or, like, other type of books, I start really hearing myself. Probably from third to fourth grade, I got comfortable with reading, and teachers helped. Uh, around, like, sixth grade. It wasn't until about the end of eighth grade that I felt like I could read on my learning level. But I still mentally, I felt like I was not there. And I still have insane anxiety about reading and talking to people in front of a room. It took me a while, um, around like sixth or seventh grade. That's when I, it kind of clicked for me. I mean, honestly, it probably wasn't until I was in high school, until I was that comfortable that I would consider myself a reader. I could actually read by the time I was five, uh, you know, the, the kind of level that you'd be able to read. Uh, my mother read to me every single night, and so my vocabulary was always much better listening. I could understand a lot more than I could reading because I had to sound everything out. Mm -hmm. What do you think helped you the most? Well, at first, um, like the first couple months, like the first two months that they found out, I didn't have really any help. But then afterwards, um, Miss Spelker at my old school, um, she helped me learn a lot of things like reading, basic pronunciation. Probably the teachers that took time and, or all the teachers that took time and uh, read to me instead of me having to read the book out loud, like like falling along on the pages, but the teachers reading it. Uh, definitely assistive technology and um, teachers like giving support to that. I got tutoring from sixth grade to the middle of eighth grade. Well, it was one on one, and it was the Wilson program. And it was two times a week for two and a half hours, I think. And it, uh, and I had reading class during the day. I had a reading specialist um, tutor that helped me with um, sentences and learning how to read a little bit more fluently. I went to a special classroom where they sat me at a computer and they gave me a program, which didn't really help me. It was like 30 minutes a day. So my parents actually went to a specialist. So every weekend I would go to a specialist who would teach me Orton Gillingham, which helped me tremendously. So third grade, I saw a teacher, a reading teacher, and I was pulled out of class for that. And then when I went to middle school, I was in a, a reading, a separate reading class from other people where I had uh, a different teacher. I didn't go to regular English class. I went to reading class. And um, I still saw my elementary reading specialist after school for tutoring. She would work with me. We worked for hours. We worked for hours every evening. And then in the summer, my routine in the summer was I read between 8 and 12 every day in the summertime. Then I had in the afternoons to play with my friends and do whatever I wanted. But I, I was reading all kinds of novels. We, I was winning awards at the library because of the number of books I read, but that was because mom saw to it that I read. What would have been different if you had known and gotten help in kindergarten or first grade? I would probably be reading really good, like, fourth or third grade. Yeah. Well, I think maybe that I could could have learned a lot more things sooner, and I could have been paired with teachers that knew I had it before second grade. I think it would have been different because I think I would have known more, like, about reading, and I think I would have been more comfortable with it earlier on, and even my parents say that it would have been better if you had known earlier on, but we didn't. I think it would have helped my family, made them feel like they weren't doing something wrong, because they were trying their best, and I just wasn't learning like my brother or my cousin did. And so it was a lot of making them feel better and making them feel like, making them feel at ease about it. I think it would have helped tremendously because I could start reading like my 
fellow students um, more fluently when I was in like first, second grade. So if I were to know in kindergarten that I had it, I would have gotten help from both the school, would have gotten outside help from my parents hiring a tutor, and my self-esteem would have been much higher knowing that I'm not just stupid, I'm just different. I can do everything that everyone else can do. I just need a different way of getting there. I think the biggest thing that I can take away from that, because I, I was lucky in the fact that I had parents who supported me and parents who knew what I needed. The thing that I take away from that though is the confidence. So, you know, when you can't do something, it's very hard to sort of pick up, right? Where you, where you should be able to sort of pick up and be normal, right? Um, so I think it would be a self-confidence thing. Um, you know, it was hard. Kindergarten was okay. I remember kindergarten being awesome and fun and like, you know, you do kindergarten things. First and second grade were very difficult for me. Um, and I remember crying a lot, um, not wanting to go to school, things like that. So I feel like if we knew and I was getting the help I needed, that sort of feeling wouldn't have been there. Um, that was really hard for a long time to get over. In those days, there was no in intervention. Uh, if it hadn't been for my mother, I probably wouldn't be a school teacher now. I probably wouldn't have gotten my degree. My mother uh, let me know I was smart. My mother let me know that I was capable and that all I needed to do was learn to see what other people saw. And she never treated me like there was anything wrong with me. You know, I was always supported with, you know, being able to do what I needed to do. Early screening and intervention by trained teachers is the key. Early screening and intervention is the only thing that will change the outcome for students with dyslexia. Thank you so much to the Howard School and Erica Affeman for putting that video together. Um, they did a really good job of presenting uh, personal stories and you what did. I, I what that, I especially something for life out in the reef, and I saved him. So that Nova can't get there yet. Oh dear. <laughs> what I really like is the fact that two <laughs> is somebody on autoplay. <laughs> Um, on Vimeo. Uh, one of the things that um, this video points out is that there are, there are lots of adults who had the same experience that our kids are having now, um, but it was very different back then. Um, first of all, phonics was still Um, our kids need more and the awareness just wasn't there. I have spoken to state legislators about dyslexia and they have acknowledged that they themselves are dyslexic as they like to say they were dyslexic um, because clearly they got past some part of um, the, the educational part of their lives and moved on. And that's where the rubber really hits the road because dyslexia is an educational problem. It's not a medical problem. And I know there are people who like to throw that in as a big red herring. Oh, it's a medical problem. You need to go to the doctor. And it's like the doctor is not the, the doctor is not the one in charge of that. Our pediatrician was not, uh, you know, he was an old school guy, but he, he, he didn't have anything other to, uh, other to say about it than here are some pills for the attention issue. And that's a whole other problem because, you know, chicken, egg, which, what's the problem? And, and why is it so easy for schools and teachers to suggest that 
it's an attention problem that needs medication when it isn't an attention problem that needs remediation. And that is where the frustration lies for so many parents and, um, and why there's all, always this conflicting message going back and forth. Oh, it's medical, oh, it's educational. It is educational. That is, that is the source of, of the treatment for dyslexia. And it, we need to get push people towards a preventative model where identification and intervention is dealt with early in a child's school career. Uh, this wait to fail model is damaging students on a level that um, I know personally is very difficult. Um, and I know that many, many parents have struggled with that. And um, so uh, Hillary, if we can move to the next video, which um, if we could do Terry Nolan from Learning Ally, um, she has a very power powerful ma uh, message about assistive technology and um, the Matthew effect. And Hillary, that one came through as a link to a different subscription service. Do you want me to try and pull it up? Stacy Court sent the email. Hillary, can you unmute yourself? We can't hear the video. I'm about word. There is no comprehension strategy powerful enough to make up for the fact that a child can't read the words. These are the words of Dr. Anita Archer. And I love this quote because it's so true. If our kids can't decode words, how are they supposed to engage in grade level content in comprehension? Our students that are struggling readers and students that are dyslexic need words. Dr. Marianne Wolf talks all the time about word exposure and the need for students to get access to words. This is where assistive technology can come in and augment that process, like with the Learning Ally audiobook solution. This student no longer has to use brain power to decode words. They are freed up in their mental capacity to think about comprehension, understanding, story, character development, all of those things at grade level. Assistive technology is so important in the lives of students. Did you know that research tells us that a teacher can only explicitly teach 300 vocabulary words in a single year. Our students need way more access to words than that. This word deficit is often referred to as the Matthew effect. We want our students that are struggling readers, students with dyslexia, not to have to encounter this deficit let's bring in assistive technology to augment this process. But in no means am I advocating that we leave out explicit instruction. It's a parallel path, we need both. We need explicit instruction and then our students go back to class and we need assistive technology to bridge them to grade level content and understanding. Because one thing I know in working with students, they can do it. They have the cognitive capacity they have the understanding to be able to engage at grade level. Let's do both. Let's give our kids access to words. Pardon my pause. Someone had an IEP question that I could answer very quickly. <laughs> 
technology. Uh, in the state of Georgia is 60 days from the day you sign consent to evaluate. <laughs> Not 40. Start the clock. Everybody here is heads nodding. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, the, the Matthew effect uh, was written about by a professor named Keith Stanovich. And in it, he describes um, based on the parable um, from the book of Matthew, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. So access to uh, written materials needs to be increased, but not as a substitute for uh, appropriate intervention. Um, there are a multitude of ways for students to gain access to recorded materials, more so than um, in the last 15 years. Um, our public library systems have done a very good job of integrating into their collections access to recorded materials using an app and platform called OverDrive. There is also the Libby app, which is part of OverDrive. The unfortunate part of Libby and OverDrive is that it does not present the text to the student but it is a free and freely available uh, point of access. Learning Ally it has over 80,000 titles in its collection and most of the books are read, well all of the books for their collection are read by volunteers. Not all of the books include text but if you look at Learning Ally, most of the books include the text and it highlights as it's reading along the story and you can speed up the story so that you're listening faster. That's one of the tricks that dyslexics who use assistive technology have done is that they can listen very quickly um, because their mind is geared towards auditory processing of that information in the classroom and they can speed it up a little. Um, and take in more information um, because as Sally Shaywitz says. Uh, dyslexia robs a student of time and time being on the one hand you've got a paper due and you've got 40 pages of text to read versus being able to listen to the text get the paper done rewrite the paper these things get more important as your, your student gets older because the work demand goes up and it is so important to keep working on the dimensions of reading that don't involve just reading. The comprehension is vital. Um, the vocabulary is vital. The understanding how um, our kids often have amazing oral language skills um, because they've been soaking up what we've said to them. Every trip, when my kids were little, every trip to the grocery store or the international farmer's market was an opportunity to expand their vocabulary. What is this? It's a kohlrabi. What is this? It's broccolini. What is this? These are collard greens. You know, there, there are million, millions upon millions of words that our kids can learn um, and know what they mean. And like she said in the video, if, if a teacher's only able to give vocabulary lessons uh, for 300 words, that's not very much, given how broad our language skills need to be by the time we graduate from high school. Um, Hillary, I think we have one more video. We do, we definitely have the video for the kids, which we need to broadcast again, because everybody needs a good cry several times a day. It's always fun when you can't see your screen. I have a superpower. I have a superpower. I have a superpower. I, I think, think differently. differently. I see the world differently. I'm a dreamer. I am a builder. I am a creator. I'm an actor. 
I am an innovator. I am a boundary breaker. I am a difference maker. I think outside the box. What box? There is no box. Not with me. I have no limits. I can do anything. Anything I put my mind to. My brilliant mind. My dyslexic mind. Yes. yes. We, are, we brilliant. are brilliant. Yes, we can do anything. Do you know who else saw things differently? Do you know who else had a brilliant dyslexic mind? Albert Einstein. Charles Schwab. Muhammad Ali. Whippy Goldberg. Galileo. Henry Ford. Richard Branson. Spike Lee. Thomas Edison. Harry Belafonte. David Spielberg. Annie. 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 Do not underestimate me. Do not sell me short. Do not tell me I can't. I just need you to help me. Learn to read. With evidence-based reading instruction. Evidence-based? Yes, evidence-based. Evidence-based, as in based on what science tells us about how most children learn to read. Help me learn to read. With the science of reading. And watch me grow my wings. Watch me fly. Watch me soar. Watch me change the world. Because I can do anything. With my With brilliant, brilliant dyslexic mind. mind. That is what you can do when Megan Swingle is in your corner. Thank you so much, Megan, for writing that amazing poem. And um, thank you to every single one of the parents who volunteered their children to participate in it. Because that is the kind of thing that when we go to the Capitol and kids come and we are changing hearts and minds because these kids can articulate to legislators um, what their struggle is and put it put a face to the struggle and that is one of the reasons why I'm so sad that we couldn't be on the campus of the Capitol um, today but um, it really children's voices need to be heard and and children's voices need to be believed that's one of the things that um, if your child is coming home from school from kindergarten and they say they have a headache or a tummy ache or they don't want to go to school, you need to believe them and you need to dig in because um, these kids, unfortunately, because of the way the system's set up, a lot of uh, schools think that putting behaviors first um, is part of the package and Unfortunately, it's putting intervention first, it's putting identification first and intervention first. And a lot of the behavioral things that kids are doing will subside because the threat is no longer there. Um, there is a wonderful uh, behaviorist named, named Mona De La Hook who says that um, behavior is communication. And we need to believe that. We need to tune into that. Our children are telling us when they come home that they are not well, when they are in a situation that is designed to break them. Um, I don't want to get into my son's story, but I, that's a lived experience for me as a parent. And it is not pretty. And I talk, have talked about my son's story to some people and some people know it, but um, I know that a lot of parents can relate to having the principal call you all the time about your child's behavior and not having an IEP that in any way, shape or form met your child's needs. I knew in third grade that when my son's small group teacher had brought in a Lakeshore phonics book, we were really in the weeds because she didn't know how to help him. She, she wanted to help him, but she wasn't being supported by her administration or the district in providing that help. 
So that's why the parent voice is so vital to all of our children, because the more noise we make, the better off our children are going to be long in the long term. And we are often our child's only safe place. And that's the hard thing about dyslexia because our kids have superpowers and our kids have amazing strengths, but school is oftentimes very, very hard. So it looks like it's 1154. I don't know if we wanna take a minute to um, go get coffee, go take a moment to grab a snack. Um, what did have you? We forgot a video. Oh, did we forget a video? Oh no, I don't wanna forget a video. Which video? Knowledge for the SOR. Oh yes, Nora, Nora. We need to hear what Nora has to say because this is important. I can wait five minutes. No, go ahead and run it because it's about, it's a little bit longer than five minutes. Hi, my name is Nora Worsick Schlesinger and I'm an assistant professor of literacy at a state institution as well as a dyslexia therapist. And I'm here to share some information on how you, if you're interested in improving your knowledge um, as a teacher around the science of reading, or if you're an administrator and want to um, promote the science of reading in your, your faculty. So hopefully this information will be valuable to you. One place to start is the Dyslexia Informational Handbook. This handbook has um, common terminology for all clinicians as well as all educators so that the terminology um, that is going to be used, such as in an um, individual educational plan, will be the same between teacher, administrator, psychologist, speech language pathologist, perhaps a um, ESL teacher or a resource teacher. Um, this handbook provides information about universal screenings as well as the teaching of reading and much more. This would be a very good first step. Another document free by the Georgia Department of Ed is the Professional Standards Commission Dyslexia Endorsement Guidance Document. This is important for really two reasons. It's important for um, educational institutions that are wanting to present or provide a dyslexia endorsement that they use it as a reference for um, suggested course content that should be um, presented so that a quality dyslex dyslexia endorsement is provided. And I would recommend anyone, a teacher or educator that's interested in getting a dyslexia endorsement Hi, my name is Nora Worsick. Hi, my name is Nora Worsick Schlesinger and I am an assistant professor of literacy at a state institution, as well as a dyslexia therapist. And I'm here to share some information on how you, if you're interested in improving your knowledge um, as a teacher around the science of reading, or if you're an administrator and want to um, promote the science of reading in your, your faculty. So hopefully this information will be valuable to you. One place to start is the Dyslexia Informational Handbook. This handbook has um, common terminology for all clinicians as well as all educators so that the terminology um, that is going to be used, such as in an um, individual educational plan, will be the same between teacher, administrator, psychologist, speech language pathologist, perhaps a um, ESL teacher or a resource teacher. Um, this handbook provides information about universal screenings as well as the teaching of reading and much more. This would be a very good first step. Another document free by the Georgia Department of Ed is the Professional Standards Commission Dyslexia Endorsement Guidance Document. 
This is important for really two reasons. It's important for um, educational institutions that are wanting to present or provide a dyslexia endorsement that they use it as a reference for um, suggested course content that should be um, presented so that a quality dyslex dyslexia endorsement is provided. And I would recommend anyone, a teacher, educator that's interested in getting a dyslexia endorsement, use this um, guidance document as a checklist. Use it to um, evaluate if that program that you're interested in um, pursuing is following the guidance document so that you're assured of getting the quality dyslexia endorsement. Another way to learn about the science of reading, even as a teacher administrator, is through grassroots activism, such as decoding dyslexia. Joining the Facebook pages, there are 50 throughout the United States, one for each state, as well as in three Canadian provinces. And this grassroots organization has been very powerful in helping to bring the science of reading forth and helping to make some legislative changes um, on that end. It's important for you, if you felt as a teacher or administrator, that some things are missing in the programs um, that you had in undergraduate or graduate around literacy, share that with your administrators so that they can start to see the need for the science of reading embedded throughout that K through 12, um, pre-K through 12 um, education and how we can use language to help in our birth through five programs. So one way would be to start your activism now. Um, the Decoding Dyslexia Georgia um, is having a um, activism activity on February 23rd to reach out to our senators and representatives um, and let them know about the science of reading and what you feel needs to be incorporated in reading so that teachers come out well prepared to address struggling readers and to use the word dyslexia so that districts and teachers do not shy away from that terminology because using the same terminology and med medically based terminology is very important. So hashtag say dyslexia. A really important organization's website to visit is the International Dyslexia Association Georgia branch. And boy, have they a deal for you. Because of the pandemic, the annual conference um, hasn't been able to be held. And so this year they're providing three free, cost-free webinars. All you have to do is register. And one is coming up quite soon on February 24th with Dr. Kearns presenting what dyslexia is and what kind of instruction is important. Other things you'll find on this website is really screening information, legislative action, and really important are grants for teachers. So if you're an administrator or a teacher and you want to learn more about the science of reading, look at the grants that are available um, so that perhaps you can defray the cost of learning about the science of reading. Another organization that's fairly new to the scene, maybe a year and a half or two years, is the Reading League. The Reading League is a national non-for-profit organization and what's really unusual about the Reading League um, that puts them in a league of their own is that they have a peer-reviewed journal that's written and edited by both educators and researchers. It is the hope that these types of journals will help close that research to practice gap that we are seeing by providing rich, informative research that's easy to digest and implement. Um, they are an organization set to promote and reimagine um, re the future of literacy instruction and education around the globe, not just in the United States. The literacy education that is rooted in science. So please 
I hope this is informational. Reach out to any of the reviewed organizations to help with your concerns and questions about dyslexia and the science of reading. Thank you so much. If anyone wants to run the bathroom, now's your chance. Thank you to all of the people who put together presentations. That is just absolutely remarkable um, that we've been able to put together such a great uh, message. Do take a minute or two break. I'm gonna start in with Sherry Hall, who didn't take a break and is sitting right there next to me. So if you could unmute Sherry Lucas Hall, and I'm gonna give you a brief introduction to her. Sherry came two years ago to a decoding dyslexia meeting that we had in person at Swift School. And um, a lot of tears were shed that evening. And um, Sherry has been one of our most vocal proponents um, online and she has uh, she has two degrees from Mercer University and um, in at being a teacher she and she'll tell this better than I she found that those degrees did not serve her uh, needs as a professional in the teaching space and um, she has a very painful, raw story, and she is learning so much about the science of reading. She has been um, instrumental in learning more, sharing her story. She is going to be embarking on letters training, which is Louisa Motz's reading uh, program. I already started. You started. I, yes. saw a picture, I saw a picture this week of the package that arrived. I got the book and I couldn't help myself. I started already. <laughs> so, so excited. So Sherry Lucas Hall comes to us from Gwinnett County. She's a former DeKalb County educator, if I got that right. Yes. And um, Sherry, let's talk a little bit about your story and how you came to find us and how your, um, what your mission in life is. So I had to pull out my tissue because the memory of my first meeting with decoding dyslexia at the Swift School is still very painful. I, I, the funny thing is I, I hadn't really thought about it since till, till you just said it. I try not to think about it because I remember that day very clearly and how I realized how many students that I had failed just because I didn't know um, uh, let's a little correction. Maybe if I change course, I'll stop crying. Um, <laughs> I do have two degrees. One is from um, my teaching degrees from Mercer. My undergraduate degree is actually in business from um, Northern Illinois University in Illinois. Um, that's where I'm originally from. I've been in Georgia now for 22 years. Raised um, three children, four children <laughs> in Georgia in the school system in DeKalb County. Um, two of my children went to Gwinnett County Schools. So my youngest daughter was at um, Rosebud Elementary and then Grace Snell Middle. And then my oldest went to South Gwinnett High School and then Grayson High School. They both graduated from Grayson High School. Um, but I, I taught in, in DeKalb County Schools for you know 14 years, started as a paraprofessional after school teacher. And then in 2008, um, I got an opportunity to teach provisionally, ended up um, Teaching in 2008, uh, went to school for a graduate degree and received it in 2010. And the entire time from 2008 to 2010, I was just excited. I'm like, I'm going to learn all this stuff and I'm going to be able to teach. I always wanted to teach. <laughs> just get that straight. I always wanted to teach. I just avoided it. I kind of took a detour because when I wanted to teach when I was younger, I just, teachers didn't make any money. I didn't want to be a teacher. I didn't want to be broke. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't want to teach, but I, I had, I'd wanted to teach since I was a, in kindergarten or first grade or something like that. My family tells me all the time I used to make people sit and play school with me. So, I mean, I always wanted to teach, but I had a kid early. I had her at 20 
And I decided there's no way I could survive on a teacher's salary. So I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing that. So I went and got a degree in business. And the reality is that even in business, racism and biases, you know, show up. Um, that's just the truth. And I, I, my degree in business didn't really get me anywhere. I was still in an environment where, you know, just the biases exist. That's all I can say. And I had a hard time getting promotions, um, even though I knew I was qualified. So um, we moved to Georgia in 1999. My kids were still small. Um, my youngest went to school and um, I just started volunteering. I just, I, I knew I wanted like school. So when she went to school, I kind of went to school and the principal walked up behind me one day and she said, you're here so much, you need to work here. And I laughed at her and she said, I'm serious. And so I ended up working at the school as a parapro and after school teacher. And I did that for four years. And even in that four year time period, I remember seeing students that were, you know, you get to proctor as a parapro. I remember seeing students that couldn't read the test. And I'm like, how does the baby not know how to read a test? He's in fifth grade. Um, I mean, they literally couldn't. And so you had to, you know, sometimes read certain things to them if they had, if they had the assistance, you could read it to them. But for those kids that didn't have it, you were watching that Christmas tree on this test, uh, you know, just randomly fill in and they'd be finished in five minutes. I'm like, no, that's not right. You know, and then of course, went back to school, got their master's degree, and then I'm still seeing kids that are struggling to read. You know, even though I thought I knew what I was doing, I clearly did not because they were still struggling to read, even though all this, you know, knowledge, this teacher knowledge I thought I had, I was still finding it difficult to teach some kids how to read. And um, I started teaching the EIP class uh, in kindergarten. And so, you know, for five years, I taught EIP. And in EIP, what you get are those students that have behavior issues. That's the bottom line. You get a lot of the students that have behavior issues. So they have behavior issues and they have academic issues. And so you're having to teach between the behavior issues and still address the academic issues. And sometimes you get support from your administration and there are days that you won't get any support. I remember distinctly standing in the hallway at my door and having two students out in the hallway fighting because you know whatever the issue was at the time, I had called administration, they were probably busy. And so I'm teaching at the classroom door, a classroom full of kids and watching two kids in the hallway fight. You know, And again, as an educator, I had no idea that those behavior issues had to do with dyslexia. No idea. No, I had ne never gotten any signs of reading uh, classes in my, in my, in my um, coursework at Mercer. Um, I actually looked at it and, and saw one of the courses is a course on reading specifically, and it was a balanced literacy course. It taught balanced literacy. So the idea was that you, you know, fill your environment with read with books, you know, and you expose the kids to books and eventually they'll just learn how to read. There was no specific instruction on how to teach kids how to read, you know, uh, and, you know, that was my experience as a classroom teacher. And when I finally met de Decoding Dyslexia and Tina and uh, I had actually been dismissed from my job for an accident with a child. Um, during the course of his behavior, he had been at the school for a few years. During the course of one of his challenging behaviors, I called his mom, I called the front office, couldn't get a response from anybody. I was clearly told, you'll have to deal with this on your own. And in my quick response to him, I responded way too fast. Um, and I heard him, I, I hit him in the head with the bathroom door. And I was sent home that day. This was December 10th, 2018. Um, I was sent home that day. The next month, I met Tina and decoding, decoding dyslexia, and Natalie Felix was there. Um, and I learned about dyslexia. I mean, I had heard of it, but didn't know anything specific. But sitting in that meeting, I heard all of the kids and the faces I saw and the memories I had. And that one child that I remember being sent home for, I'm like, these kids had dyslexia. And I shut down. I, I lost it because 
I'm like, here I am wanting to make sure that I can teach these kids how to read. And I didn't even have the tools and the skills that I needed to be able to do that. And I had failed so many. I realized that I had failed so many students in that process. But the good thing is I stuck with it. I learned a lot. I've learned a lot about the science of reading. I've learned a lot about dyslexia. I've learned a lot about why kids struggle to read and what we can do as educators to make sure that they don't have those struggles and we give them the foundational tools they need to learn to read. Um, and now it's just a matter of making sure I can um, you know, provide that to students that need it. Um, I could not get back into the school system because um, honestly, I had a record. I had gotten arrested behind that incident and um, there was also an attempt to take my teaching certificate. So um, I couldn't find a job. Um, and so in February, 2020, when the record was finally expunged, I decided to um, get my own business. I said I could serve these kids better outside the system than I could have ever served in one classroom. Um, I could speak out about the needs that I know they have. Uh, I just thought I could serve everybody better if I was outside the classroom. And so that's what I did. Design to Teach Tutoring was born in February of 2020 and I've been on this journey ever since. That was a long story, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so to tie into that story and a couple of, at least one other parent whose face is on this board um, in March and the date escapes me off the top of my head, but the Atlanta Speech School's Montag lecture this year will feature Emily Hanford, who is of APM Reports and Emily as a journalist has done more to expose the literacy crisis, the reading instructional failure, the bad practices. All that of her podcasts became my Bible. Our schools. Um, and she is, she has interviewed or is in the process of interviewing both Sherry mm -hmm. as well as Missy. <laughs> and Missy. our Georgia stories <laughs> are going to be told um, because they need to be told. And um, I, the first Montag lecture that I went to uh, was about oh, eight or nine years ago. I think it was the first year my son was diagnosed and it was Marianne Young, or excuse me, not Marianne Young, Marianne Wolf. Wolf. Marianne Young is an advocate here in Georgia. <laughs> and uh, Marianne Wolf had just written Proust and the Squid, which is a very dense book about reading. Yeah. And um, so anything that the Montag lecture has to say, they bring the best and brightest and shine a big spotlight on it. So I'm honored that um, Emily has chosen to reach out to you two to discuss um, teacher preparation and classroom instruction because that's where the rubber hits the road for our kids. It's the teachers who can spot a child um, early and provide help to that child who are going to make the biggest difference in that child's life. Um, as the Howard video pointed out, there are teachers who are knowledgeable who can assist students within the public schools, but they are few and far between. And in some of these forums, they're just, there's so little teacher knowledge. And this is, this is just really, the pandemic has put an additional spotlight on this because so many parents have figured out that um, they're missing. reading, their child is not really reading, they're guessing yeah. and yeah. guessing is not reading. So um, yeah, the, um, that's where we are. And um, Sherry, do you have anything else to add to that? <laughs> I think I added enough. <laughs> 
I think that was a pretty good ad with me snotting and everything. So no. <laughs> so uh, I know I know we have a lot of uh, we have an eclectic group of people on the group right now. And thank you, Matt Carter's. Um, I see you have to jump off. I'm going to close my chat window so I'm not off looking at the right hand side of my screen <laughs> out of the corner of my eye. Um, and it looks like we have about 46 participants right now. Um, I want to take, I don't know if we want to take a two minute break, stretch your legs for a second. I might do that. My feet are getting cold. My house is cold. <laughs> Stop my feet for a second. Um, because the next part of our conversation is going to pivot to talking to Brian Jordan, who is an amazing uh, all pro, all star player for the Atlanta Braves and the Atlanta Falcons. Um, and Brian's right there. Hi, Brian. Can uh, Hillary, can you unmute Brian so that we can hear what he has to say? Hello, everybody. Hey, Brian, I am delighted <laughs> to meet you. Delighted to be here. And Tina, you're doing a great job. And thank you for sharing, Sherry. That was great. <laughs> so um, a little bit about Brian. He's got quite the biography. Um, he was an all-star player for the Atlanta Braves for a number of years and um, an all-pro player for the Atlanta Falcons. And thankfully for probably your entire body, the uh, Braves won over the Falcons. <laughs> and now that we're at the age of arthritis, um, Brian and I are roughly the same age, so um, I, I get it. Um, you had an over, was it an over 20 year career on the fields or right at about 20 years? Right at about 20 years. Okay. That, that is stamina. That, <laughs> that is determination. And that is a love of West Palm Beach, Florida. Yes. Yes. I'm missing, I'm missing it right now, Florida. <laughs> I bet. So Brian is a Baltimore, Maryland native, and he is here in Atlanta full-time now and fully committed to the Atlanta community as a philanthropist. And um, one of the most special philanthropic endeavors that you've done recently that's come on our radar is that you have created the Douglas County Reading Challenge, um, where you are challenging students across Douglas County to improve their literacy. Um, Hillary, do you have that video that's embedded in the tweet that we can show and screen share and volume on? <laughs> Gotta love technology. Let's see. Um... And Ellen Hill says several classes from Skank School are watching. Uh, yes, I'll get into that too. <laughs> All right, here we go. Our very own Brian Jordan teamed up with the Douglas County School System to kick off the Brian Jordan Reading Challenge. The challenge motivates third graders to read through competition, something Jordan knows a thing or two about. The event kicked off at the Factory Shoals Middle School where teachers competed in fun games and activities to get them excited about the program. When we were approached with this initiative, we thought, okay, another reading I can help you. It's up. And just compounded, it's better than anything we could have ever imagined. You get excited. Someone says, Hey, I want to do this in your building, in your school. And initially, you're excited. But when you sit down with Brian and he begins to tell you his vision, where he wants to take it, and then it, like he said, it snowballs. But to understand that it actually came to fruition is like it mounts on top of overwhelm. I am in it wholeheartedly because I want to. Press to help. Because I don't want to see that kid like I was growing up, embarrassed to read and not challenging himself 
and putting all his eggs in one basket like we see so many athletes do in life. We're going to be able to motivate young students to do what they enjoy doing, doing which is to compete and using the reading to do so. I'm very excited about it. The results, I believe, our literacy achievement in our county is going to skyrocket. Yeah. It's a home run. So it say. is. It's a good one. <laughs> This is a year-long initiative where the winners, they have an opportunity to hit a grand slam. The winners of this reading challenge get a chance to go to a Braves game, get field trips, and, of course, spending some time with Brian Jordan himself. Okay. Go to purposes. Yeah.